So I assume it's 1.15 and I should just get started? Is there any other official? Okay, good. Well, I was hoping I'd get, you know, some important person up here to introduce me, but I guess I'm not important enough for that, so that's okay. Um, my name is Tim Matson. I am from Intel, but this is aggressively not an Intel talk. There will be the absolute minimum of Intel content in here. So I, I'm really talking to you as, as, as an old parallel programmer, and I'm much older than I look. So, and I'm just a dumb application programmer. A lot of the other people talking to you are hotshot famous computer scientists. I am not a computer scientist, and I'm proud of that fact. All right? <laughs> I am a scientist who uses computers. Computers are boring, dull, 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 yuck. But what you can do with them is outrageous. So I'm going to warn you up front, if you can think of yourself as a computer scientist, you might find some of my stuff a little superficial. You know, I'm not going to go down into the details of architecture because if I have to worry about the details of the architecture, something's wrong. So I'm a programmer. I want to write code and I want to make it work. And as you'll find out, I don't understand anything until I see it as code. So uh, I got to look at a lot of code to make sense of this stuff. But I want to open with a little preamble about parallel programming because, you know, this is the parallel programming boot camp. You're here, I'm assuming most of you have done little or no parallel programming and you're here to become a parallel programmer. So I want to do a little bit of preamble before I get into OpenMP. So as you may have heard, parallel programming is hard. But I want to dig into that a little bit deeper because, you know, frankly, programming is hard. Whether it's parallel or serial, the process of programming is, 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 you know, let's face it, it's difficult. It's intellectually stimulating, but it's hard. And so on one hand, parallel programming is really just a new wrinkle on something that's already hard. But it has a reputation of being really hard. And I think it's worthwhile to pause for a moment and think about that reputation. First off, if you go and, and look at the literature or pick up a book on parallel programming, you're overwhelmed by these dozens and dozens of different programming languages and APIs. Oh my God, I've got to learn 20 different languages just to sound like I know what I'm talking about? That's ridiculous. And then algorithms, don't even get me started on how many different parallel algorithms there are. It's just, it's totally overwhelming. The second feature is people like me, you know, if you sit down with me and talk about parallel programming, what I'm going to talk about, I'm going to talk about Oh, the incredibly difficult projects where I had to stay up for a week without sleep and ended up in the emergency room with a caffeine overdose to get this program to run. And so we kind of build up this war story reputation of making it really, really hard. Um, but also, there, there are new concepts. You know, you're, you're going to have to deal with synchronization. You, scalable algorithms are different than serial algorithms. Um, distributed data structures, something I'm really big on. You know, they're different. So... There's, there, there are some new wrinkles in there that legitimately make it harder. But it's not as bad as you think. And it's really important you keep this in mind. First off, there are a variety of libraries and frameworks out there that take over a lot of that complexity for you. And I really, really urge you, before you start any parallel programming project, first ask the question, has someone else done it first and can I use it? So you should never write a parallel FFT, never, okay? Except for its pedagogical value. You know, I, I teach a parallel programming course, and one of the assignments I like to give is, okay, write a parallel FFT, now never use it again. But it's important for you to know how painful that was, because it, you know, it's a growing experience. But, you know, FFTW, they have great parallel FFTs in there. Trillinos is a marvelous framework for parallel algorithms. So, you know, look around and you might find a framework or library that does all the hard stuff for you. And that time up front to look for that could be time very well spent. It's also not as hard as you think because if you talk to your buddies in the computer science world, I mean, you know, we create languages. That's what we do. It's fun. But that means that you have a glut of languages and it's really, really scary and frankly, leave the new languages and new APIs for parallel programming to the researchers. It's valuable for them to work on. We need those new ideas developed. But if you're interested in writing code that solves a real problem, stick to the, the, the big ones, okay? Stick to the industry standards. If you're going to be working on a shared memory machine, 
it should be P threads and OpenMP. Okay, right now, as it rolls out, C11 is, 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 is a great language for parallel uh, programming, and I think over the next year, as good, robust solutions, implementations of it roll out there, that'll be a good option. If you're on a distributed memory machine, you're, you know, you're an idiot if you use anything but MPI. Um, and then if you're gonna do heterogeneous computing, mixture CPU and GPU, open CL. So if you stick to the standards, and I mentioned these open source ones, TBB and eventually Silk, remains to be seen how established Silk will get in the, in the uh, open source world, but they're kind of like coming along as well. If you know that you're gonna be restricted to a particular platform, then work with what's best for that platform. So if you know you're gonna be running on NVIDIA hardware, I mean, I, I don't think I'm speaking out of term when I say that NVIDIA puts a huge amount of work into making CUDA really, really excellent on their hardware. If you know you're deploying on NVIDIA today and you know you'll be on NVIDIA tomorrow and if forever into the future, it's an excellent solution. Um, likewise, if you're in the Microsoft world, C++ AMP is, is a really well-designed technology. Um, maybe these fringe solutions in the HPC Exascale, the Partition Global Address Space Languages, they might be something very useful. Uh, UPC, which you'll learn more about on Wednesday, or one that was not covered anywhere in this course, Global Arrays, my favorite. Um, you know, but, but what I want to leave you with is it's not a long list. And trust me, you do not want to pick anything that's not on this list unless you have a very, very specialized application. Um, and then finally, it's not that bad because we've been doing serious application programming since the early 80s. And so we've, we kind of have figured out what works and we've kind of figured out what everyone's doing. And it's really easy to look at all the algorithms out there and just be blown away by the complexity and the variety and all the different things going on. But the fact of the matter is, we've been able to organize them into a collection of design patterns. And this picture here, I'm not gonna walk through it all because you're gonna get a whole talk about it tomorrow from Kurt Kreutzer. The, the, the takeaway message though, is most parallel algorithms that people actually use is an instance of one of these seven basic patterns, is all. You learn these seven basic patterns and, and most of the time that's all you're gonna need to work with. So it's really, parallel programming is actually kind of easy. It's really no harder than serial programming. Eh, it's a couple little wrinkles, but it's not bad. You know, if you stick with pthreads, OpenMP, OpenCL, MPI, maybe TBB if you're a C++ person, you know, th that's it, you're done. You, you learn these seven key patterns, okay, that's it. And then really, you need to just master, totally master the patterns you actually use. And frankly, for most scientific computing, that's gonna be SPMD, loop parallelism, and if you're doing GPUs, kernel parallelism. That's it, that's all. Just learn those three things and pick a language, you're done. So see, this isn't that bad. It's not that bad at all. Um, so if you become overwhelmed during this course or over the coming years as you spend time with parallel programming, I suggest you just print a copy of this slide and put it above your desk. Not because I'm an egomaniac and I like the idea of people having you know, one of my slides above their desks, but just so you can look back and remind yourself, wait a minute. It, it's just one of these seven patterns. I'm really confused by this program. What pattern is it? Oh, that's just SPMD. All right, hey, that's easy, all right? Just to remind yourself, it's not as bad as you think. So with that preamble out of the way, let's move on to OpenMP. And OpenMP is extremely important because it's, it's our answer to the question, how easy can we make shared memory programming? And OpenMP is our answer to, let's make it as easy as we possibly can. You can't do everything with it, it's not for everyone. But for application programmers, it's as easy as we make it, can make it. And what I like about OpenMP, and the reason I often use it when I teach parallel programming, is you quickly, I mean literally within 15 minutes of talking to you, if we were doing this as a hands-on course, you would be writing your first parallel programs. By the end of one or two hours, you'd be dealing with sophisticated, complex parallel algorithm issues. Because the API itself is so simple, you immediately get to get into the, the intellectually stimulating parts without getting bogged down in all the details of the API. So it's a great way to get started in parallel programming, even if your ultimate target is gonna be somewhere else. So let me talk about it, and to do that, I wanna kind of tie back into what you heard this morning. 
So I'm going to assume you all now know more than you probably ever cared to know about parallel architectures. Um, in fact, I'm surprised so many of you came back after lunch, because listening to that previous talk, I'd be running away from the room screaming about, oh, this is so complicated. How am I ever going to do this? But um, you know, you, you, you don't trust me. We'll make it a little easier as we go on. So you know about parallel architectures, and you know about the concept of multi-core chips, where you have collections of cores that share an address space, and the caches are what make everything fun. All right? You know about threads and the concept of a cache-coherent shared address space. All right? And you know a little bit about pthreads. Now, I, I, you know, most of you probably aren't going to run off and write complicated pthreads programs tonight when you go home. But you, know, you at least know at a high level what we're talking about. Now, I only understand stuff when I see it as code. So I, I, I have a running example I use again and again when I do talk about parallel programming. And it's this trivial example, often called the Hello World program of parallel computing. Because this is probably the simplest program that does something real, that doesn't take a lot of code, so it fits on PowerPoint. PowerPoint drives so much of what we do intellectually in this world. So it fits on a PowerPoint slide. And if you do everything right, it will actually go faster as you add threads. So it's, it's a really good program for getting started. And it's just, I'm taking that integral of 4 over 1 plus x squared from 0 to 1 and approximating it as a sum over rectangles. So this is the pictorial version of it. And so I just sum that up, and I get an approximation to that integral. And it's cool because I can check to see if I get the right answer. Because unlike many people, I'm kind of weird. I care about is it fast and does it give the right answer. So I, I do like to have the right answer at the end. That's another difference between me and computer scientists. They're not always as concerned about the right answer. So here's the serial version of the program. Stare at it a moment. Does anyone have any questions? Is everyone digesting their lunch and just falling asleep? <laughs> okay. I'm assuming everyone can read C. Even if you don't like to program in C, it's kind of become the common you know, base level. I'm going to talk about C extensively. When we get to the end, if you are a dominant Fortran programmer, come talk to me. There's a, there's a magic decoder ring that takes me all of five minutes to walk you through. So you can take everything you've heard about C and drop it into Fortran, which, by the way, is God's language. We happen to know for a fact that when she created the universe, she did all of her modeling on Fortran. It's the best language. But we're going to do C. So we just got this simple loop right here that I hope you all can immediately see just sums up those rectangles as we march across the domain for our integration. So let's turn it into a parallel program. And since so far the only API you've had any details about is pthreads, let's just as a reminder and to tie us into this morning, create a pthreads version of this. And you know if I'm going to do this in pthreads, what I have to do is take this inner block where the meat of the computation is occurring, and I'm going to package that into a function. Now I'm accumulating into a sum, so I need an accumulation variable. So I'm going to have to take that variable sum and make sure that it's shared. All right? And uh, I need to assign loop iterations to threads, so I have to come up with some trick for doing that. I'll show you how I do that in a second. And uh, I need to somehow make sure that the different threads accumulating into this variable sum don't step on each other. I don't want a race condition. You know, a race condition, every time you run the program, you get a different answer, and, and, and that's bad. So uh, how am I going to do that? Well, I'm just going to show you very briefly. You know, I'm, I'm going to create my function here. So here I have a void function pointer. It's going to take a single argument, which I'll use as the ID of the thread calling the function. I'm going to put in file scope variables, the, uh, the things all threads need to read, and my accumulator value. And I'm going to need a lock, a mutex lock, to protect the update of the partial sums. And so I have to create that mutex up front. Now, this is a trick we use a lot. Uh, I learned it first in the message passing world, but it actually is a real quick and dirty way to split up loops between a number of threads in a shared address space. I have an ID that runs from 0 to the number of threads minus 1. I'll call that my rank. So I'm going to take my loop, which used to run from 0 to the number of steps minus 1. And now I'm going to run it from my rank to the number of steps, and I'm going to increment it by the number of threads. So it's exactly like I'm dealing out a bunch of cards, right? First thread number 0 will get 0. And if there's four threads, and it'll get 0. It'll get number 4. It'll get number 8. It'll get number 12. Thread number one will get number one, it'll get number five, it'll get number 13. I think you get the idea, right? It's, it's called a cyclic distribution. 
Can I get head nods from everyone? Is this like, okay, good. I need feedback. Otherwise, I don't know if I'm going too fast or too slow. So, you know, if you just sit there like a lump, this will not be an interesting talk for anyone. So interact. All right, good. And um, so then as I've created that function and I've set this stuff up, there's a whole bunch of just cred I have to do to manage the execution of that function. So I have to initialize my mutex. Then I have, to, um, I have to create the threads. So I have this loop here over the number of threads. I need to save what the rank is for, for the, the thread i. So I'm going to save that rank. Then I'm going to launch a pthread create, which will spawn a thread with that function, passing in the loop index so I have an ID on it. And then I'm going to have to wait until they're all done. So that's what the join does. So the thread, pthread create, we call that forking a set of threads. And then I'm going to wait until they're done, which is called a join. So fork threads, join threads, then clean up and print my final answer. All right? So that's my program. And this happens again and again. We've even given it a name. We call it the fork join pattern. And in the fork join pattern, the program starts as a single thread of control. When you come to a place where you need additional threads, you fork the threads. They march forward in a shared address space. So you've got to do a lot of synchronization and crud like that. And then when they're done, you join back. So now you have a single thread again. You march a little further until you need more threads. You fork them off again. They all do their work. Then they join back together. So your program becomes the sequence of single thread, multiple threads, forked, and then joined. And you march right on through. And that's what it looks like. So, um, you know, a lot, lot of stuff in there. You notice that an awful lot of what I did was kind of mechanical. You know, creating the threads, forking the threads, joining the threads. Can't we automate that? It just, it just seems. Why should you have to do all that crud by hand? That's what OpenMP does. All right? At a really, really high level, what OpenMP does is it defines a set of compiler directives so that instead of you packaging a block of code into a function, you forking a bunch of threads, you having to put the join in there. Um, it, it just, it, you, you, you could just have directives that tell the compiler, do this for me. And that's what OpenMP does. So it's a set of compiler directives, and then there's some stuff that have to be done at runtime. So there's a set of library routines and environment variables. But it's mostly the set of directives, which in C are going to be some pragmas. We define how those map onto Fortran, C, and C++, which for computational sciences, that's the lion's share of the languages out there that matter. And really, um, you know, it's funny. I'm probably best known for my work on OpenMP. I was part of the initial team that created it. But in many ways, it's the most boring thing I've ever done. It's the most important, but it's the most boring. Why? Because Unlike other standards efforts that I won't name, MPI, but other standards efforts, um, we took the principle that we were going to standardize stuff we already knew how to do. So we were boring by design. And you're raising your hand or just scratching your head, or both? <laughs> OK. OK, the question is, you're interested in trying out OpenMP. Is it already installed? How do you get access to it? Yeah. All right. Um, we're going to, so, so, wonderful question. This is really cool. Because this afternoon at 5 o'clock, we're going to get together, I guess, at, well, you guys know. It's on the written schedule. I think, is it called Corey over there? Or so, Soda Hall. It's in Soda Hall. Um, we're going to have a session where we actually get you up and running with OpenMP on your, on your laptop. So I see you have an Apple laptop. If you have Xcode, you have OpenMP. It's already there. And we're gonna, so what we're going to do is one of the labs tomorrow afternoon will be working with OpenMP on your own laptop. So you're limited to the concurrency on your own laptop. Eh, that's not very interesting. Wouldn't it be more fun to have dozens and dozens of, core, of cores to play with? But what I like about it is when you go home or when you're sitting on an airplane looking for something to do, you've got a parallel programming environment with you right there. So OpenMP is everywhere, just, just about everywhere you have a shared memory machine. So the GNU compilers support it. The C-Lang environment supports it. Uh, 
The Windows Visual Studio compiler supports it. The Intel compilers support it. The PGI compilers support it. Uh, so it's available on Windows. It's available on Linux. It's available on Apple's OS. Uh, so OpenMP is available just about everywhere. So uh, there are very few standards that are as ubiquitous as OpenMP. So chances are, if, if all of you are programmers so that you just have a compiler on your laptop, chances are you already have OpenMP on your laptop. Um, and we will say more about that at 5 o'clock when we actually tell you about what compiler switches to use, how to access it, and, and that sort of thing. So it's available everywhere. And as I said, it's the fork, I mean, it's just, it's an implementation of the fork join pattern. You got a master thread. When it forks a set of threads, we say that you're in a parallel region. And when you're in between parallel regions, we say that you're in the sequential part of the program. So I kind of think of it as a string of pearls, where the pearl, because it's beautiful and elegant, because you have a collection of threads working for you. So it's like a pearl in the rough. Now, so you got the master thread, it creates a team of threads, and the master is a member of the team of threads. And those threads have an ID. And the ID goes from 0 to the number of threads minus 1. We sometimes call that a rank. And the master is always ID 0 of that set of threads. And you can actually, though not all compilers support it really well, you can nest parallel regions. So if a thread's coming along and it's like, gee, I would like even more buddies to help me on this piece of work, you can fork more threads and have nested parallel regions. So very elegant, very cool in that regard. So once again, I'm really stupid. I only know what I see in code. Let's look at a Hello World program in, in OpenMP. So here it is. I'm going to have a main. I'm going to have an int that I'm going to use as an ID. And I'm going to print hello. Then in a separate print statement, I'm going to print world. And I want to see what the ID is. So if I run this serially, it's going to say, hello, zero, world, zero, new line. Right? To turn this into a parallel program with OpenMP, this is all I have to do. I have to give an include file so that to pick up any prototype, function prototypes, or any types that OpenMP may use. And then I'm going to have a pragma that says pragma OMP parallel. And this is basically the fork command. It says fork a number of threads. Now, inside the brackets, the curly brackets, that code will run by each thread. Every thread will redundantly run the same code. And then this close bracket, this close bracket is the join. They'll all join up at that point. It's as easy as that. What could be easier? And if I ran this, oh, so I guess, uh, you know, there we go. Now, um, what I'm doing here is I'm saying run with the default number of threads. And I will talk about that later, how do you manipulate the default number of threads. OpenMP is designed to be portable, so you write one piece of source code and you compile it to run on any number of parallel machines, whether they have a pair of cores on your laptop or 128 cores in a big, you know, large shared memory machine. So there I'm just saying, you know, give me the number of threads that's default for this environment. But I'll show you later how to manipulate that. Yes? Are the printf's thread safe? Oh boy, this is interesting. On every implementation of OpenMP that I am aware of, the printf's are thread safe, and you will not overlap records. So I won't get HEL from one thread, then L0 from another thread, so they'll print out the whole record. Now, are they guaranteed to be thread safe? I don't know. They used to be. It may be that they're getting more flexible on that. But as I said, every implementation I know, it is thread safe. But we just inher we, you know, we inherit what's there anyway. We don't have our own OpenMP printf. Most quality systems, the printf is thread safe. So if I run this, I might get, and each time I run it, it's going to be different. So that is technically a race condition, though not a data race. Um, so I might get hello from thread 1, hello from thread 0, world from thread 1, world from thread 0, which you know, has the new line, hello from thread 3, hello from thread 2. Now, the point I want you to realize, and I know that the previous speaker made this very, very clear, that when you run a multi-threaded program, you get every interleaving of those statements. So they're going to interleave in whatever complex way meets the semantics of the program. So I've done nothing to enforce the order and force it to, you know, print hello world from one thread before it goes to the next. 
So those are going to interleave in whichever way. And the challenge, much of the challenge of shared memory programming is making sure that every single way these can interleave will still give you the right answer. We'll say more about that later. So um, the core syntax of OpenMP is uh, for C, and, and as I said, if, if you're a dominant for, I'm just curious, how many of you are Fortran programmers? Don't be shy. We only have one? Wow. Well, bravo for you. You know, round of applause. This is really cool. That, that, uh, yeah. We love Fortran programmers because, you know, real programmers code in Fortran. Uh, okay. Come talk to me afterwards if you want, and I can give you the secret decoder ring to translate C into Fortran. It's, it's, it's a one-to-one -one mapping. It's easy. Okay. But I, I hope you're okay with us sticking with C. Um, so it's pound pragma OMP. That tells the compiler this is an open MP pragma. Then the name of the construct, and obviously over the next couple hours, between now and three, I'm going to teach about a bunch of different constructs. And then there can be an optional set of clauses to modify that construct. So that's always going to be the form. All right? So for example, pound pragma OMP parallel, and I would like you to give me four threads. That's the example I have there. So that pragma OMP parallel says create a bunch of threads, and the num threads clause says, oh, and by the way, please try to give me four threads. And I'll have more to say about that in a moment. Okay, you've already been introduced. Pound include OMP.h. You probably already have that memorized, so you should have no problem there. Now, most OpenMP constructs apply to something called a structured block. And within the next few slides, you will understand exactly why that's the case. But a structured block is a block of code, which in C or C++ means it's between the curly braces. It's a single statement or it's compound statements between uh, a block of statements between curly braces. And um, you have one point of entry at the top and one point of entry at the bottom. Okay, so it's, we're kind of like helping the compiler to make its job easier by saying, hey, compiler, we're not going to bounce into the middle of this block and we're not going to jump out of the middle either. You can assume that we'll always enter at the top and we'll always exit at the bottom. That's what we mean when we say structured block. So I like to introduce that up front so throughout this tutorial, this, this discussion, I can always say structured block and you'll all know what I mean. The only exception is I can put an exit statement. I can say shut down the entire program. All right, so the key to OpenMP, and this is actually the key to multi-threaded programming, whether you're using P threads or C++11 or OpenMP, it's pretty much the same basic idea. We're creating lots of threads. When you're creating threads, you're fundamentally assuming these threads are sharing an address space. So the threads have an address space that they share. They have a private space that's their own that sits on their stack. They have a shared address space that usually sits on the heap. And so they, they should have a shared address space. They communicate by sharing variables. The challenge of it is, is that you get unintended sharing of variables. And this creates data races. So the real challenge of this kind of programming is making sure that every single way those threads interleave their instructions leaves you with a correct result. So data con the race condition caused by data races usually is the bane of shared memory programming. How do you prevent them? Well, you use synchronization constructs. You learned about the mutex, there's others. You use synchronization constructs to where you need to constrain order and serialize steps in the algorithm, you do that synchronization constructs. As you can imagine, synchronization is horrendously painfully expensive, so you try to avoid it by manipulating the data environment. So these are the four pieces of what we'll cover. Does, does that sound okay? You know, I'm curious, how many of you have written an OpenMP program before? Oh, God. Okay, good. So I'm only going to bore about 20% uh, uh, of you. All right. Those of you who raised your hands, um, think up particularly difficult questions uh, so, so that you can show everyone how smart you are and so you can be entertained as we go through with this. All right. So here we go. Let's talk about creating threads. So. You basically create threads with the pragma OMP parallel. That creates a set of threads. Now, there's multiple ways to tell it how many threads you want. I showed you one with the num threads clause. Another one is a runtime function routine. OMP set num threads. And the key thing for you to understand is inside the, uh, with inside the structured block, every thread will execute those same statements. So, 
Every thread, we'll call int id equals omp get thread num, so that returns an id between zero and the number of threads. You're guaranteed that that rank will be unique between threads, and you're guaranteed that it'll go, you know, for four threads, zero, one, two, three. So you can depend on that in your algorithms. And then everyone's going to call poo, or whatever function I put in there, they're going to call that function on that thread, and I'm going to pass in the arguments just with regular C behavior. So with this example, because I created this data in here, everyone's going to have their own value of ID, and everyone's going to share that value A. And just to be sure you understand that, and drive this point home, here's looking at exactly how this thing will execute. All right? So let's assume I got four threads, and I declare an array outside the parallel region, with very few exceptions, if you declare it outside the parallel region, it'll go on the heap and be shared between the threads. If I declare it inside a variable inside the parallel region, then it'll be private to each thread. It'll go on the thread stack. And so this code here, which I reproduced up in that corner, the way it will execute is I will create the set of threads, assume I got four of them, and everyone is going to create their own version of ID, so it's private to each thread, but everyone's going to have access to the same array A. So I'll have four versions of that function running, one poo 0A, poo 1A, poo 2A, poo 3A. You can tell I'm the father of what, when I made the slide, young boys, because you have to have poo in your slides, because it's a chuckle if you're under 10. Um, then when you're done, you join back together and you go on. All right? So I need to see a head nod. Here to come with head nod. Is this blatantly obvious to everyone? Okay, I'm not getting a lot of head nods. Is that a problem? All right, did you guys have too much for lunch? You know, let's interact. All right, okay? Simple. It's amazing how much you can do with this. Now, what the compiler does is it takes that code in between the block and it creates a function. And, and compiler people, computer science people, for some reason, call that function a thunk. And I've asked multiple compiler people why they call it thunk, and I've never gotten a good answer. But they call it a thunk. All right? That's the function that the compiler creates that's the body of that loop. So in this case, it would just be a call to the function foobar. All right? Now, it's going to create, the compiler will do this for me. It's going to create you know, a reference to the p threads, uh, threads data type. It's going to create for me that for loop to create the threads. It's then going to call that join at the end. So basically, the mapping between what you did as a pragma and what the compiler did for you should be really clear from this slide. And it's great because you don't have to think about that. So now, let's create the parallel pi version of this program. All right, and let's talk about this. So I'm going to add my pragma OMP, include OMP.h at the top. All right. Um, I'm going to define the number of threads I want as 2, pound defined threads 2. And I'm going to tell it I want that number of threads, OMP set num threads. All right. So I'm going to do that right there. Now, I need to create a place to store the partial results from each thread. So that was the single variable sum in the scalar version of the program. But now if you think about it, I'm going to have each thread off creating their own version of sum. I want to give them their own private little space to do that. So this is a really, really, really common trick in shared memory programming. Look at sum. What it is is I created an array of the number of threads. This is called promoting your scalar to an array. So I took that scalar sum that I'm going to do a partial sum into, a partial accumulation. I created an array. I've got one of those elements for each thread. And notice inside here, I replaced the scalar sum with a reference to that array element with ID. So this guarantees that each and every thread has its own little chunk of memory to accumulate its results into. And therefore, I do not have sharing. And at the bottom of that loop, each thread can just fully run as fast as it wants, and everything's cool. And I use that same cyclic distribution of uh, loop iterations that I used before with the pthreads program. All right? Now, there's a little subtlety here. And I'm surprised no one's raised their hand and asked about it. So come on, guys. You're, you're, you're falling down on the job here. Why? Why do I need this call to end threads equals OMP get num threads? I know how many threads there are. I said pound define num threads two. And I said OMP set num threads two. Why do I need this call right here? I may not get them. OpenMP, you've, you've learned a little bit about OpenMP, I take it. 
OpenMP because it has to run on any shared, address, any shared memory machine. The OpenMP standard says that the runtime can decide that you can't get the number of threads you asked for, and it can silently give you fewer threads than you want. This is tremendously irritating, for example, if you're running on your own laptop, why should you not get the number of threads you want? But imagine you're on a shared resource, you know, imagine it's a 128 processor shared memory machine, and the policy there is that no one gets more than 32 threads, and you ask for 1,000 threads. So we had to build into the standard the ability for how to work even in that environment. So if the runtime decides that you asked for more threads than you really should get, it can give you fewer. So this becomes a typical pattern that OpenMP programmers use. You ask for the number of threads, then you always check, well, you know, what's my ID? You always ask, you know, how many threads did you actually give me? And if I need to know that externally, I'll have one thread that I select, write that into a shared variable. All right? So this creates a version of the Pi program. And this is a very, very common pattern. You should learn it. It's called single program multiple data. This is the found, probably this is the most commonly used pattern in all of parallel computing. And what the foundation of it is, is every single unit of execution, whether it's a process in MPI or a thread in OpenMP, they're all running the same program. And then they look at their rank, or it's ID if you prefer that term, and they look at how many of them there are, and they decide how to, how to change their program logic based on their ID and the number that are there. It's a very, very simple pattern. And it's overwhelmingly the most popular pattern used in parallel computing. So you can see, this is the SPMD version of this program. Every thread's going to run the same block of code. And it's just going to look at its ID and the number of threads. It's going to use that to split up the work. So this is the SPMD version of the Pi program. All right? And this works really well. Well, sort of well. You know, uh, running on my laptop, which can run four hardware threads on two cores. Um, I can get 1.83 seconds if I run it just pure, straight serial program without OpenMP. If I run it with OpenMP on one thread, it gets 1.86. So you notice I am very, very honest. I'm not like some people who lie to you and, and try to compare to the parallel version of the program on one thread. You always have to compare to the serial version without the parallel programming environment. So you can see that I got 0.03 seconds overhead just by the fact I was going to a parallel API. So 1.86 seconds with one thread, two threads 1.03, three threads 1.08, 1.08, four threads 0.97. Is that very good scalability? <laughs> well, one could say fabulous because it's two cores and I went 1.83 to 1.03, but I actually should be able to get much better. Oh, I have questions in the back? Okay, you know, with these bright lights up here, it's hard to see. So I'm having the over, so, so this is using the simultaneous multi-threading, Intel, uh, sorry, uh, in, let's see. It uses Intel hyper-threading technology. I think that's the right, there's, there's a set of words we're always supposed to use. So yeah, this is using an Intel processor with Intel hyper-threading technology. Um, so <laughs> you get four threads on a dual, oh, this is being recorded, oh dear, I gotta be careful what I say. <laughs> It's using a marvelous technology called hyperthreading. We love it. Yeah, so you're having overhead that the, that the uh, processor is at the hardware level bouncing back to extra threads. But there's even something else going on, which we will talk about on the next slide. So we'll come to that and say a lot more about that. Question in the back. Is it possible it didn't give me the number of threads I asked for? Okay, excellent question. I'm glad you asked that because I want to get this really clear. I asked for a number of threads. I start a parallel region. When the parallel region starts, it may give me fewer threads. But once it gives me the number of threads it decided I should get, it gives me that number and that number will always be there for me. So let's say uh, num threads was equal to 50. And the parallel and, and the runtime system decided, no, I should just get 20 threads. 
All right? So then I come in here, when I do that n threads OMP get num threads, it will return 20. And I know inside here the number of threads it decided to give me, I will truly have. So I know if it tells me 20 for this, yes indeed, it gave me 20 threads. But it may not give me the number I asked for in this line. But by the time I get in the parallel region, the number it gave me, I truly do have that number all the way through. Does, is that what you were asking? Does that... Oh, no, okay, yes. This is the number I actually got. Yes, this is the number I actually got. So in other words, when I printed this, uh, you notice I saved the number of threads I got inside the parallel region. I saved it to a variable that was shared so it would be visible outside. So when I hit the print statement that I don't show you on the PowerPoint at the end, it really did print the number of threads I got. Okay, there's another question behind you. Right, right. Marvelous questions, you know, and, and um, obviously the right way to master all this is if we spend an entire semester working on this. So uh, this semester, CS194, <laughs> we'll go through all of this in a lot of detail. Take my class, it's great. It's Kurt Koitzer and I do it together. But I'm going to answer your question, okay? So what you have to understand is in a shared address space environment, you have all these threads working and they're interleaved in ways you don't control. All right? So it is possible that partway through writing, so if you think about this statement end threads, it's possible that partway through one thread writing into a shared variable, another thread could start writing it and they could conflict. And you can get all sorts of chaos. It's a, da it's a data race if you have multiple threads uncontrollably writing into the same address. Even if they're all writing the same value. All right, this is a subtle point. What if I have 10 threads all writing the number three into the same address at the same time? That's still a data race. Because there are architectures, depending on how write buffers are organized, that they could trash each other. So you notice I'm very, very careful I have a private variable end threads local to a thread. So every thread calls how many threads did you get? And only one thread does the write into the shared copy. Now I could have had the one thread call the OMP get th num threads. I could have had only one thread do that. All right? Why didn't I do that? Well now, you know, I'm I I I'm a parallel algorithms guy. So um, if I did that, I would have to tell all the threads, wait until the one thread that does that read is done. It's actually cheaper to have each thread call OMP get num threads than to have one thread call in and everyone wait. All right? I don't know if that made sense, but you know what, I, what I'm going to say is I want to go on, but you've got to come and talk to me if that didn't make sense to you afterwards. You still have a question. Good. Yes. Oh, I could have done a lock, I, I, but I chose, uh, but we'll, we'll get to locks later. Really, we'll get to locks later. Let, let me keep going. We'll get to locks later. All right, uh, but there's a very important reason why the scaling was so bad. And uh, did you hear about false sharing before in the previous lecture? I, I came in late. Let me tell you about false sharing, because this is, this is one of those little idiosyncrasies of a shared address-based programming environment that just drives you crazy. That just, it's one of the reasons shared address space programming truly sucks, all right? Because the array sum, it truly is the case. Some zero, some one, some true. Those, are, those array elements are distinct for each thread. Each thread is working with a different element of the array. There is no data race there. There is no sharing going on there. It's just as crystal clear as can be, but... By the marvelous wonders of cache architectures, it just so happens that a block of those sit on the same cache line. So thread number zero grabs, uh, you know, sum zero. And now, meanwhile, thread number two is ready to write into sum two. What's it going to have to do? It's going to go and look at sum two and say, oh, that cache line is held by another thread. 
I need to invalidate that cash line. I need to go get a fresh copy of that cash line. So that cash line is going to be sloshed right over here. Meanwhile, I've invalidated this cash line. So when this thread's ready to write into some zero again, which is happening inside a tight loop, so it's happening again and again and again, it's going to say, oh, well, I need to invalidate that cash line on that other thread and go fetch a new copy. So that cash line is going to bounce back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. So be, by virtue of the fact that these variables are sitting on the same cache line, you get sharing at the cache line level. The semantics of the program is correct, but it leads to abysmal performance because I'm bouncing that cache line back and forth. That's called false sharing. And there are a number of techniques, and once again, if you were, you know, if you're taking a semester-long course from me, we would go through these. There's a number of ways to deal with that. But I'm going to give you one inside OpenMP. And to do that and describe that, we're going to have to talk about synchronization. So anytime you talk about shared address space programming, you've got to include synchronization in the discussion. And synchronization is how you impose order constraints on the program or in, uh, when, when you need to impose order constraints. And typically when you need to do that, it's because you need to organize access to shared data. You got multiple people reading and writing into the same addresses, and you need that to happen in a well-ordered way, so no matter how things are interleaved, you get the correct result. Now, in OpenMP 3.1, this is your synchronization constructs. You've got the critical section, the atomic, and the barrier, which I'm going to talk about in the next few slides. Then you have ordered, which I'm not going to talk about at all. And then next lecture, after we take a break, I'll talk about flush, and I'll talk about locks. These are kind of lower level. We, we try and steer people away from ever using them, but they're, they're there anyway. And because they're there, I'm going to talk about them. But right now, we're going to talk about the simple ones. So a critical section is a very well-known concept in uh, parallel computing. Um, and what it does is it lets you define a statement, or if I put curly brackets, a structured block, that are going to execute with mutual exclusion. So only one thread at a time in this parallel program here. Uh, it's an SPMD program, so I have that standard pattern. Give me the ID. Tell me how many threads you have. You know, in this case, I did another cyclic distribution because it's really clean and easy. Then I'm going to call this function, do a great, big, hairy, ugly job that's going to take a lot of time. And then one at a time, I want to consume the results of that into, by, by this call of this function. And I want to make sure that only one thread at a time calls the consume function. So, Pragma OMP critical says one thread at a time can call the, st the structured block that follows it. Now, imagine if I have another thread comes along and hits this, and another thread is already executing the statement inside the critical section. What will happen then is those other threads will sit and wait at the critical section until they get their turn. So obviously, if you have a critical section inside a tight loop, it's kind of a bad thing because then most of your threads are doing nothing but waiting for their turn. So you want to be real careful with how you use this construct. But it's a very, very easy way to, uh, to protect the updates to a single value. Now, hardware has uh, a set of operations that are very efficient for simplified versions of safe updates to a variable, and they're done atomically. Atomically means an operation that either completes all the way or doesn't happen at all. And you can think of it as a real, real lightweight critical section in OpenMP called Atomic. Pragma OMP Atomic, and it basically says, use the hardware support for doing a real efficient mutual exclusion update to a single address. So in this case, I do my big, ugly computation into a private variable called temp, and then I'm going to use the atomic to just protect the update of that shared variable x. And it's going to call a hardware instruction to do that very, very efficiently. It's really subtle, and I'm going to make this statement now, and maybe later on, if someone wants to talk to me later, I'll talk about the exceptions to it. But in many senses, you can think of this as a lightweight version of critical. It's going to give me mutual exclusion update to a simple, I mean, mutual exclusion access to a simple update. So that's the atomic. Yes? How do you close the atomic or the section? Just the first Great question. Okay. In C, you have this real nice setup 
where a statement is either a single line or a block of statements between curly brackets. All right? So inside, not, not atomic, inside critical section, I could have as many statements as I want, but I would have to put open bracket, all the statements, close bracket. And it would do all of those statements inside the critical section. Does, does, did, did I get the right question, answer? Otherwise, it's just one line. Just one line. And, and that's just a C-ism. You know, it, it's like, what's the, if you go look up the formal syntax of C, it's like a statement is one line or a block of statements between curly brackets. So in this case, I did just a simple one line. Now let me tell you, because of the nature of parallel programming and you want things happening in parallel as much as possible, you typically make what's inside a critical section as simple as you can. So you'll go out of your way in designing a parallel algorithm to have you spending as little time inside a critical as possible. So you could almost, you know, in most cases, that's exactly how you'll see critical in a program. But if you had multiple steps, no problem. With critical, put it inside the braces. With atomic, we really do restrict it. You know, look, it has to map onto hardware atomic structures. So it's going to be, you know, X binary operation on expression. It's going to be increment, a decrement. It's going to be a very simple, and it's just protecting the assignment into that variable. I'll say more about that later. All right, another question. Yes? How does OpenMP handle the situation that all of the threads arrive at this pragma atomic at the same time? So same thing would happen as with critical. So if all the threads hit at the same time, one thread, you have no way of controlling which, one thread will ex execute the atomic, everyone else will wait. So I think you can see synchronization is brutal to your scalability. If you over-synchronize, you can just kiss your performance goodbye. So a lot of the challenge in writing quality shared address-based programming is how do you manage your synchronization. So you have just enough, but not too much. All right, we have to keep going, though, because we're going to completely run out of time. We have an OpenMP construct called Barrier. Barrier is next to critical section, probably the second most common. In fact, maybe it's even more common than critical section. What Barrier says is, all of the threads arrive here before any of them move on. So look at this example. There's a lot going on in this example. So by this point, you should be getting pretty familiar with this. Pragma OMP parallel creates a bunch of threads. And I have a clause where I'm describing the data environment. So I'm like foreshadowing. It's like it's a dramatic element, right? In good writing, you always foreshadow the cool stuff that's coming down the road. Okay, I'm foreshadowing the very titillating discussion we'll have coming up on the data environment by using a couple data environment clauses. But you know what they're doing is probably pretty obvious. I'm saying, look, A, B, and C, variables A, B, and C are shared. And the variable ID is private. Each thread has its own copy of ID. So this is another way of saying that, all right? So I'm controlling the data environment by saying A, B, and C are shared, and ID is private. Each thread has its own copy. So here I go. ID equals OMP get thread num. You guys are probably sick of seeing that. You know it really well. Then I'm going to do a huge calculation, big calc 1, and every thread's going to call this because it's an SPMD pattern, and every thread's going to do something slightly different because I'm passing in the ID. And when they're done, they're going to assign it to, the L to an element of the array A. All right? Now, later on in this block of code, I'm going to use A. So I can't move on until I know everybody is done with that filling the array A. That's where I would use the barrier. So the barrier says, all right, I don't care if one thread finished that in a millisecond and everyone else took 10 seconds. You know, that thread finishing in a millisecond, you're going to sit on your butt and wait. So that's what happens with barrier. Then when all the threads get to the barrier, we now can release. All right? Now, we go inside the Pragma OMP4. Oh, gosh. I'm introducing all sorts of cool stuff here. Sorry about that. Pragma OMP4 says take this loop and run it in parallel. So now it's taking the iterations of this loop, and it's choosing how to split them up between threads. That's what Pragma OMP4 does. I'll say more about the detailed syntax later. But I'm splitting up iterations of this loop between threads is what that Pragma OMP4 is doing. And you can see, it's doing another big calc. And I'm inputting the loop index variable and that shared array, and I'm going to fill another array, C, when I do that. All right? Now, later on, I'm going to use that array, C, 
So once again, I have to make sure all the threads are done before anyone goes on. What we have decided in our infinite wisdom, because those of us who created OpenMP are friggin' geniuses, we figured that it's safest if by default we put a barrier at the end of that pragma OMP parallel 4. So there is an implied barrier at that end of that pragma OMP 4. Now, that, that shows you an important philosophical point of view with OpenMP. We try to make it so that the typical stuff you do is going to be safe. All right, so most of the times when you're in a parallel loop, you kind of want all the threads to finish with the loop before anyone goes on. So that's what we put. We put a barrier there. But what if you want to turn off that barrier? And for the sake of time, I won't walk through the details because I think I'm like approaching cognitive overload on this slide. But I just want to point out that if I, in my infinite wisdom as the programmer, know that I don't need that barrier, I can say skip it with a no wait. All right, that's what the no wait clause does. All right, yes, a question in the back. I'm sorry, what was that? Oh, I did that outside. You know, this is a PowerPointism. I have to get everything to fit on a slide. So before this pragma OMP parallel, I would have declared A, B, and C. Okay. To a, to a first order of approximation, if you declare variables outside the pragma OMP parallel, they're going to go on the heap and they'll be shared. If I declare the variables inside the parallel, then they're going to be private to each thread. But what I did on this slide, because I'm as a dramatic element foreshadowing what's coming later, I'm showing you some data environment clauses. So I can also say shared. Now shared's a little bit redundant. It's sort of reminding me that those are shared. But private ID says there's an ID declared outside, and I'm going to make that private inside. And you know what? I want you to hold that question, because later on I'm going to focus on the data environment clauses, and we'll say more about them in detail. So can I move on? We have another question over there. Yes? Yes. Okay. Great. Oh, boy. That's, that's another question that I could answer in about two hours. So, yeah, um, OpenMP in C is really straightforward. In C++, you have this whole other design element. And I'll be really honest with you, as much as I'm very proud of, of OpenMP and it works with C++, it works beautifully with C++, most hardcore C++ programmers I know don't like OpenMP because they don't like pragmas. Because they want to build the concurrency and the concurrency management into their classes. All right? Now, as I as a C++ programmer, I would want to build into my class the locks. And you can do that in OpenMP, but the problem is you still have these pragmas to create the threads. And C++ programmers often um, um, are uneasy with pragmas. Now, I'm just curious. How many of you consider yourself hardcore C++ programmers? Got okay, gosh, not very many. Cool. Do you know how many of you have raised your hands? No TBB. All right, you do. You don't. Let me tell you. If you are a hardcore C++ programmer, the programming API for you is TBB. Uh, it is TBB, Threaded Building Blocks. It was created by Intel, but it's been fully open sourced. And the people behind it at Intel told me the version that is open sourced truly is the same as the Intel version. So in other words, it's not a sleazy Intel trick of, well, we put the crappy thing out there as open source, so you'll fall in love with it and buy ours. No, they tell me that really the open source one is the full quality one. But I mention it because... TBB was created by Arch Robison, who, he, he knows I say this, and, I, and he cringes every time I say it. He's probably the best concurrency expert alive today. He, he, writes, he writes lock free data structures in his sleep. The guy is not a normal human being. It's just amazing. And TBB is his answer to the question what do C programmers really want? 
So that, you know, you have these parallel container classes and all this stuff that's really complex that's built into the class structure and it supports that style of programming. I personally find it insufferably obtuse. I hate it. But I'm not a C++ type programmer. You know, I look at all this template stuff and lambdas and it goes just like, yuck, get it away. But, you know, if you love that stuff and if you've, and if you've made the transition so that's the way you like to program, look up TBB. However, still learn OpenMP because I stand by this statement I said earlier. Even if ultimately you want to go somewhere else, OpenMP is a way for you to start writing parallel code and learning parallel algorithms and learning the issues of synchronization and data environment and false sharing and parallel algorithms with a lot, without a lot of API clutter getting in your way. So OpenMP is still a wonderful introduction even if ultimately you want to go to CUDA or TBB or Silk or one of these other things. All right, I got to move on because I'm totally out of, I'm, I, I've completely lost track of my time management. What time is this first lecture supposed to be over? I think 2.15, right? Wow, gosh. This is awesome. I'm totally blowing it. Oh, well. <laughs> Hopefully you're having fun and learning something, though. All right. So this is a version of the SPMD programming. And all I did is now notice I declare my sum as a scalar inside the parallel region. It's no longer that shared array. All right? So now I do the sum inside, and it's no false sharing because I'm not sharing an array element. And chances are, if you're, if you're pulling sum off each thread stack, they're not likely to be on the same cache block. All right? So off we go. But I still need to accumulate those values, and I need to do that inside the parallel region. Because what do you think happens to int i, id, n threads, x, and sum, those variables that sit on the thread stack, what do you think happens to them after the join? Any ideas? Anyone want to call out? What do you think happens to these private variables local to a thread after the threads have joined? They're gone. They're gone. So when I get to the end here, at that bracket that closes this one, all these private variables, like those partial sums I just accumulated, go away. So I have to do the final accumulation into pi, my shared variable. I have to do it inside the parallel region. I protect it with a critical section. OK? Pardon? Pragma OMP critical. I created a critical section, so that's where I'm doing the final accumulation right here. All right? And when I do that, now I have no false sharing because each, you know, we're going into a, uh, we're, we're um, um, going into that variable on the stack, not the array. And now my performance is surprisingly good. It's much better than I thought. I, I don't, I, I'll have to tell you, I don't completely understand why it's so good. But I went to 1.87, one with two threads, 0.68 with three threads, and 0.53 with four threads. Yeah, hmm. To those who understand the architecture of this dual core chip, that is surprisingly good. So the padding and critical are basically the same. The critical is easier, right? Yes. And I didn't talk about padding, but you know, in the long version of this lecture, in, in the six hour version of this lecture, I talk about padding. But those of you who know about padding, yeah, the critical is a much easier way, and it's portable. So the padding is when I go through and I say, ah, I know how wide my cache line is. I'll just set up my array so that each element is at the beginning of adjacent cache lines. That's what padding is. The problem is, as I move to a different architecture with a different cache architecture, and I have to redo the padding. What a pain in the ass. Well, the critical is completely portable, which is pretty cool. All right, so parallel loops and, oh boy. Well, you know what? You've got me until three. So just because, you know, when I switch over to the second lecture, uh, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll work on that, work that out. So parallel loops, I already talked about a little bit. This is an example of what we call work sharing constructs. And work sharing constructs basically says what you would think. I create a bunch of threads, and now I have an OpenMP construct that splits up the work between threads. And so the parallel loop I've already introduced, and you know what? It's pretty obvious. So... We come to another head nod moment. Does everyone understand parallel loops? Yes. You okay? You got that? Notice I still need to tell it create the threads. Pragma OMP4 says 
the team of threads that's calling this split up the loop between that team of threads. But if I could put pregma OMP4 and it's not inside a parallel team of threads, then it's just one thread executing it. You haven't accomplished anything. So you still have to have that pregma OMP parallel. Now this pattern of pregma OMP parallel bracket pregma OMP4 is so common, you probably shouldn't be surprised to know that we've defined a combined construct where you can go pregma OMP parallel 4. And that says create a team of threads and that team of threads will in parallel execute that loop. All right? Now, I'm not going to go through it because this is a high-level introduction and there's a lot of details we're not going into. But notice right now, I'm just telling the compiler, because compiler writers are smarter than most of us, we're trusting them to get the mapping of loop iterations onto threads right. Okay? Now, at this point, I could tell when I have experienced parallel programmers in the world, because when I say compilers, we can trust them, they either roll their eyes or laugh out loud. All right. The fact of the matter is compilers tend to do a really rotten job of figuring out how to map loop iterations onto threads. Left of their own devices, usually they'll do it badly. And that's because, you know, I love teasing my friends in the compiler world, but largely because I feel inferior to them. Because my programming is trivial compared to what it takes to write a compiler. So, you know, they're, they're the gods of the programming world. Um, but the thing is, the question of how loop iterations map onto threads has to do with algorithm, has to do with the nature of the algorithm, and there's no way a comp compiler can understand that. So it shouldn't be surprising to you that compilers tend to do a bad job at that decision. So there's something called the schedule clause that we're not going to talk about, but you can look up, and it's really easy, and it just gives you a way to say, hey, compiler, let me tell you how I want to map iterations onto threads. All right? So it's easy for you to look up and play with on your own, or we can talk about it afterwards. But we don't have time now. All right. So I do want to talk about a reduction, because this happens so much. Look at this piece of code here. I have a loop that's going to compute an average over an array. All right? Technically, average is a dependency between loop iterations. I can't parallelize that loop. It has a loop carry dependence. All right? For parallel loops, the loops have to be able to run independently because you're saying, hey, threads, any which thread, pick up and run this iteration. So if the loop iterations aren't independent, you can't run it in parallel. Kind of makes sense, right? It should be intuitive. So this cannot be parallelized. I put a pragma OMP4 on that, pragma OMP parallel 4, it'll, it'll choke. It will give me bad answers. But this happens all the time. So what we've done is, is most quality parallel programming environments have created something called a reduction. And the reduction works like this. You say reduction, you define an operator, then you put a colon, then a list of variables. All right? And what it lets me do is parallelize this loop here. This is the same loop we saw before. Pragma, OMP, parallel, four. Create a bunch of teams, split up loop iterations between the threads. I don't care how you do it. All right? Reduction with the plus operator, the variable av. All right? This loop will run in parallel. Now, here's exactly what happens. And, 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 and I hope, I hope this makes sense. Here's what the compiler will do when you give it a reduction. It will create a private variable, one to each thread, that will do, be the local accumulator. It'll use the same name as the variable av, but you, know, you don't care. It's creating it for you. It will initialize that variable for the identity of the operator. So, quick question. I want you just to call it all out loud and proud. 4 plus, what's it going to initialize that variable to? Gosh, that was not very enthusiastic. I was hoping to get a zero. Come on, you know, wake up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it'll use the identity of that operator to assign it to that value. All right, so it'll create a copy of av. It'll initialize it to zero. It'll go through the loop doing the local accumulating accumulation. When it's done, it will add up the value of all the threads. 
using once again that operator I told it to reduce over, so it'll do add here. And then using that operator again, it'll combine it with the shared value defined outside. So that would parallelize this program. All right? So coming back to our standard running example, notice each time I'm showing this to you, the number of lines I added to do it with OpenMP is going down. Did you notice that? As we move from SPMD to the parallel loop, now I'm just going pragma OMP parallel, open bracket. I still need to create a private X for each thread. So I have a double X declared inside of there. Then I say pragma OMP for reduction plus for sum. And that's all I have to do. When I get to the end of the parallel loop, I do pi equals step times sum. Pretty darn easy if you ask me. Right? Any questions about this? This is like, we, we call it loop level parallelism. Way, way back in 1996 when we did work on OpenMP. Yes, indeed, I told you I'm really old. <laughs> so in 1996 when we were sitting down creating OpenMP, this was like the classic pattern of usage we were thinking of. Because all of us came from scientific parallel computing background. The first version of OpenMP was for Fortran because we were all Fortran programmers then. Um, Fortran 77, I mean, yeah, that's really old, but that's, that's what people used then. Um, and, and most of your codes were, you know, finite different, finite element, you were marching over regular arrays. So loop level parallelism was mostly what people were doing. So this works really, really well. All right, and you can see that my performance is, eh, you know, not pretty good, pretty good, not quite as good as the SPMD critical. And it turns out that I could play with the schedule and get that a little better. And uh, as an exercise tomorrow afternoon, you might want to try that. But as you can see, I go from, I'll get your question in a second. The parallel overhead's a little bit higher, 1.91 seconds, because I'm setting up those, those inside my timing loop. I'm setting up the, uh, the variables for the reduction. And I'm setting up the parallel loop overhead. So somehow it's having to do the, the magic to figure out how it's going to assign those loop iterations. Um, so there's a little bit of overhead up front. But I get pretty decent performance. So by four threads, I'm at 0 0.68. And I can get that a little better if I played around with the schedule. And you had a question. Yeah. Um, so is there some zero for each of the different threads, right? Yes. What happens if some doesn't start out at zero, like starts at four? Well, then I would get the wrong answer. So let me be really clear, OK? Let's, let, let me go back to this program. Because I want you to understand, I'm, I'm hoping, I'm hoping a large number of you will show up this afternoon at 5 and will get started with OpenMP on your own laptops and then tomorrow afternoon go and play around with this stuff and start writing this code. That's what I'm really hoping will happen. So I want to make sure you really understand this. All right, so I have a shared variable sum and it's shared because I declared it outside the parallel region, right? All right, so everybody's going to have sum equals four. Now we come inside and that reduction says create a private copy of sum and initialize it to zero, right? So that happens for you. You can't make it four, the one that's created local to each thread. It's going to be made zero because of that plus. But I think what you are asking is what if that sum equals zero up there was four? I think that's what you were asking. And that's fine. That works because what it's going to do, it will give me the wrong answer for this program. <laughs> because what's going to happen is that the reduction says create a private copy of sum for each thread, do the sum, the accumulation into that. When you get to the end of the parallel loop, combine all those, then combine that with whatever value you initialized it out there. So I would get my answer in this case would be pi equals step times sum, so it would be pi plus step size times four, right? because I'd be adding four to whatever my accumulated sum was. All right. Yeah, but I mean, it's, it's, it's interesting when you look at, I've seen some really clever, tricky stuff done using the details of exactly how a reduction works. And that's why it's good to think of the steps. That you create the local, you do the local accumulation, then when you're all done, you combine them, and then combine it with the, the shared one on the outside scope. OK, I've got to move on, though, because, man, I'm like, way behind. It's just hard to get all this stuff done. So I'm going to move fast, but I want to emphasize 
These slides are already up. Well, I don't know if they're already up. I've already submitted them. Oh, and Tammy is awesome, so I'm sure they're already online. And you can download them, and the stuff I'm going over fast, you can look at. And if you've been with me up till now, you should be able to look at the slides I glossed over and just pick them up. Really, I don't think you'll have any trouble. So I want to mention a couple other things. There's a few other work sharing constructs. And what I'm going to talk about and actually use a little later is one called single. And single, it's going to sound kind of freaky or kind of weird why we would do this. What single says is the first thread that encounters this construct will execute the code inside that construct. All the other threads will wait at the end of it. So imagine, I have created a bunch of threads. They're going to go do a whole bunch of stuff in parallel, right? Then one thread is going to fudge up the boundary conditions. So I have this, this function, exchange boundaries, and I only want one thread to call that. All right? Then when it's done, all the threads are going to do a whole bunch of other stuff. So that's what the OMP single does. OMP single says only one thread will do this, and all the other threads will wait at the barrier implied right there. Okay? So there's an implied barrier, as there is with all the work sharing constructs. Now, I could put pragma OMP single no wait. And what would that do? What do you think? All the other threads would just keep right on going. So one thread would do this, and the others would keep going. What's significant? It says only one thread, only one thread does this. The other threads wait at the end. So now this, this is a way for me, if my parallel algorithm, and we will see examples of this shortly, if my parallel algorithm requires that after doing everything in parallel, there's a couple steps that only one thread wants to, you, you, that you only want one thread to do. That's what single allows. Okay. Yes. Any thread. You have, you have no control over which thread it is. In every implementation I know of, it's the first thread. All right? But there's nothing in the standard that says. So in other words, if I had logic that it really mattered to me which thread in the team did this, I would not use single. I'd have to use what's your thread ID. So, okay, I want to move on. A lot of this stuff won't make sense until you play with it. That's why I'm moving kind of fast. But what I want to do is get the ideas out there. And then when you play with it in code with a, with a team of excellent TAs to help you when you have questions, then this stuff will solidify. Um, so then there's a clause called sections, which basically says, hey, I'm going to have some blocks of code, and I want you to have one thread do each block. So I introduced that by going pragma OMP sections. And then each one of those block is a pragma OMP section. So in this case, I have a calculation, a function I want one thread to do called x. I have a function one thread to do called y. I have a function another thread to do called z. And of course, each one of those can be in between brackets to make them many statements. All right? Um, so that's enough there. And there are locks in OpenMP. And can I skip this slide? How many people really want me to talk about locks? No one's raising their hand. Skip, please. Skip it. You know what? You can look it up. If you understand mutex, you understand how to work with this. I think this slide is self-explanatory, and I want to move on. All right. Then there's a set of environment variables, and I want to talk about one of them, OMP num threads. The typical way you write OpenMP code is you go pound pragma OMP parallel, and you don't tell it how many threads. You say use the default number. Now, if that's useful, you have to have a way of changing the default number. This is how you do it. So there's an environment variable, OMP underscore num underscore threads space the, the, the value. So this is your way of telling the program, do this many threads. This is important because in developing parallel algorithms, what you're going to do is you're going to write the program, you're going to put a timing loop in there, you're going to put you know, timing calls in there, and you're going to run it with one thread, run it with two threads, run it with three threads, and watch how the timings change. Wouldn't it be a pain in the ass if each time you ran it, you had to change something and recompile? Ugh. So this is an easy way for you to change the number of threads around. All right. Oh, my goodness. Okay. 
How are people doing? Do we need to stand up and take a quick break? Or can we just plunge through the next 26 minutes and call this done? All right, good. <laughs> no, nobody jumped up and said, oh, I've got to get out of here. All right, good. Um, you know what? You can modify the data environment. And there's a number of ways you can do it, and you've seen it already. I can declare variables as private, which says put them in so each thread has their own private copy. Or I can declare variables shared, which is the default if I declare variables externally. So here's an example that I think drives this whole point home. I have an array that's a file scope, A of 10. Then I've got my main function. Then I have an array index of 10, which is declared prior to the parallel region. So that's shared. So you can imagine every thread is going to call the function work with a shared array index. Can people see that? Now, look inside that function. Okay? Inside that function, well, I'm reminding because it's in a separate file, let's say. I've got the extern statement. So I'm reminding that function. I'm reminding the compiler that it should be finding that array A as a file scope variable. That's what the extern does. But inside the function, I declare an array temp. So since that's declared inside the parallel region, which, where that function's called, it goes on the thread stack. So every thread's going to see a shared copy of A. Every thread's going to see the shared copy of index, but every thread will have its own copy of temp. Okay? This is another head nod moment. Does everyone have that? I really need to see heads going up and down. Okay? We're going to do this until I see all heads going up and down. Okay? Or if you're not getting it, I want to see the heads going side to side. Can we get head movement? Do we have people with neck injuries? Oh, come on, gosh. You're not interacting. What am I doing wrong? <laughs> You also can declare a static. A static is a way that you can, at where you would normally have an automatic variable, say, put this on the heap. That's how me as a stupid programmer understands it. So if I have a static int count, I'm saying, hey, even though you're calling this inside a function, we're going to have a single value of this, and it's going to be on the heap. So that's a way I could create a shared inside a function. So in OpenMP, we've already shown you, the, and, and these are the big ones, shared is the default. I like putting it on my pragma to remind myself that this stuff is shared. As you can imagine, when you get in trouble in OpenMP programming, is when buried deep inside the bowels of the code for a thread, you forget which variables are shared and which are private. So it's actually, even though it's redundant, it's kind of handy to use the shared clause to remind yourself of what's shared. Private says, a variable declared outside the pragma, I want you to make a private copy for each thread. All right, that's what private does. Now, it creates them and they're uninitialized, which shouldn't be surprising to you, right? I mean, you just think about it. If you're saying create this variable, it's like anything else. If you just declare a variable, it has no value in C. It's not initialized for you automatically. That's the same thing with private variables. So if you want it to be initialized, if you want to create a private and give it the value from before the pragma, that's what you use first private for. All right? And these other ones we don't use. So really all you need to think about is shared, private, first private. It's as simple as can be. All right? And I'm going to move on because you're going to see this stuff. But here's our final, we're, we're going to touch on some of this later. But this is the simplest version of that Pi program that I can come up with in terms of how little lines did I have to change. And notice, all I had to do was pound include openmp.h and one pragma. I didn't change any executable lines to create a parallel program. This is the power of pragma-driven parallel programming. Because on a pragma, if a compiler doesn't understand the pragma, it just ignores it. So if I'm very careful, I've written a program that will work with a non-OpenMP compiler and just run as a serial C program. Or if I run it through an OpenMP compiler, it will work and give me a parallel program. So this is like kind of the dream of, of OpenMP programming. Pragma OMP Parallel 4, but now I'm telling it, each thread should have its own private copy of X. By default, OpenMP says it would be nuts to have a parallel loop where the loop control index was shared. So by default, it will give you each thread its own copy of I. That kind of makes sense, right? I hope. If you're not comfortable with that, I could easily put private X comma I. No problem. If I'm more comfortable making it explicit. And I actually often do that in programs. And then the reduction. But this is 
in my thinking, as, as someone who, who for many years of my career, I wrote code for a living, and it was scientific code, you know, seismic signal processing and theoretical chemistry, quantum chemistry mostly, you know, to me, it's really awesome that I can create a parallel program without changing the serial semantics of the code. And that was our goal with creating OpenMP. The fact of the matter is, you almost never get something this clean. But, but I hope you are all blown away by the beautiful elegance of this slide. I, I hope you are, because it's beautiful. All right, so in conclusion, OpenMP, it's, it's one of the simplest APIs out there. I'm going to tell you, our goal was to make the easiest API for parallel programming that we possibly could. And I think that's what we successfully did. Um, and we covered some key patterns, and you know you need to just start writing code. Now, before we're all done, we have one more whole presentation that I'm going to cover between now and 3 o'clock. Isn't that fun? <laughs> so, yeah, no, I'm, you know what? I promise you, I will be done at 3 o'clock. I'm not going to... You guys have sat and listened to me from 1.15 to 3. That is tremendous. You have tremendous posterior fortitude. So <laughs> I want to say just a few things. Um, Why did you cross out new? We'll talk afterwards. <laughs> this is really the point I want to make. You know, with OpenMP, it's a continuous process. A lot of parallel programming APIs that people use, people come together, create it, and then go away. With OpenMP, it's a continuous process. We created the first one, we released it in 1997, and we kept right on working. And you know, for a long time, we had two separate tracks. There was a separate document, OpenMP for C and C++, OpenMP for Fortran. And then in 2005, we went through the gargantuan work of creating a single spec that covers both. So now they can move forward. And then we came up with OpenMP 3.0. And right now, most of you have compilers that are OpenMP 3.1. The Apple compiler with Xcode, I believe, is stuck at 2.5. And it doesn't support a couple of the key constructs. But uh, just this summer, just July, they came out with OpenMP 4.0. And I'm, I'm not going to talk about it at all, but if the people here do this boot camp next summer, and if they invite me, I'll want to do a whole talk about OpenMP 4.0. Um, but, you know, the point I want to leave you with from this slide is that, you know, it's cranking along. Every, every few years, you can expect a new release of OpenMP, so it's evolving and tracking the hardware. Consistent with the philosophy, we're concerned with shared memory programming, uh, and we want to make it as easy as possible. The interesting wrinkle is with OpenMP 4.0, we have added support for GPGPU programming. So instead of OpenCL, which is brilliant. How many people here are OpenCL programmers? One, two. Oh, that's great. I love it. Uh, so, do you mean OpenGL? No, I meant OpenCL. Okay. We'll talk later. You can talk to me later. <laughs> This, this is the OpenMP talk, not OpenCL talk. Okay, OpenCL is, is a portable API for writing code. The, at the easiest level, if you have a mixture of a CPU and GPU and you want to write code for it that's portable, you use OpenCL. If you want to write code for it that just runs on NVIDIA, you use CUDA. CUDA and OpenCL do pretty much the same stuff. Okay, what's really cool is what OpenMP 4.0 brings to the table is a directive-driven way of doing the same sort of stuff you're doing with OpenCL and CUDA. But you're doing it with Pragma. So sort of like as OpenMP is to pthreads, OpenMP 4.0 is to CUDA and OpenCL. And I think for most application programmers, they will only care about OpenMP 4.0. It's interesting, I think OpenMP 4.0 could almost do away with CUDA and OpenCL, which would make me very happy, even though I'm also responsible, one of the people responsible for OpenCL. Right. Yes? No, no, no it, it's, it's, it's parallel to that. Now, NVIDIA, so I don't know the direct mapping. I wouldn't be surprised if there's things you can do in CUDA that you still can't do in OpenMP 4.0. Just like 
And, and you know, that's a very good question. There are things I can do with P threads that I can't do with OpenMP. What OpenMP did is it made it so that 98% of programmers never need to write P threads code. But there'll always be those 2% who will need to write P threads. All right? I think it'll be the same thing. With OpenMP 4.0, you know if you're a physicist or a chemist or an engineer trying to get a parallel code, that probably does everything you need. But there'll be a small number of people like those writing runtime systems or fancy tools where they're going to need control over everything. They'll have to go to the low level. So those people will still need CUDA or OpenCL or pthreads. So, yeah. All right. The biggest change that has come out with uh, OpenMP in modern times is the tasking model. And I'm going to talk about the tasking model. And frankly, the other content here, you can go and read the slides on your own. The upshot of the flush and the atomics is I describe them, I go through them, and then tell you, please don't ever use them. So we won't even talk about them. Then you'll never use them. No. <laughs> but tasks you should use. So we'll have time to go through the tasks before we get to 3 o'clock. So imagine, can consider this following program. And I want you to think back to what we've talked about with creating parallel regions with the SPMD pattern and parallel loops with Pragma OMP4. All right? That's like the heart and soul of traditional OpenMP. And then you look at this code. Well, first off, a parallel loop, the compiler has to be able to deterministically figure out the loop bounds so it can do that mapping of iterations onto threads. So when we say parallel loop, we mean it's got to be a for loop. And it's got to be a for loop with well-defined bounds on that loop. Very restrictive. What if I want a while loop? Sorry, you're out of luck. There's no pragma OMP, there's no pragma OMP while. So you're out of luck. And the reason, as I said, is the compiler can't look at while P and know how to split that up between threads. So, sorry, you're out of luck. All right? So this right here with traditional OpenMP you have to really suffer to get this in parallel. Now, it can be done. And in fact, I challenge you, and in fact, tomorrow afternoon, those of you who go on with OpenMP, I challenge you to come up with how many different ways you can do it. Here's one way to parallelize that loop. And I'm going to walk you through it and then tell you how awful this is. Hopefully, you don't even need me to tell you how awful this is. So I'm going to walk through that linked list and figure out how many elements are in, in that linked list. Then I'm going to malloc some space for an array to hold those pointers to the elements of that linked list. Then I'm going to walk through that linked list a second time. Oh, isn't that great? All that memory traffic? We like memory traffic, don't we? So I'm going to walk through that linked list a second time, and I'm going to save those pointers into that array element. Now I can do a pragma OMP4. Yuck. What a dreadful piece of code to write. It works. And actually, if you're doing enough work inside the actual you know, work at the guts of traversing this list, it actually shows nice speed up. But this is ugly. You don't want to write code like this. So what you really need is a different concept in OpenMP. You need the idea of creating tasks. So you can do task-oriented parallel programming. This, by the way, for the two of you who raised your hands with C++, this is what TBB is all about. All right? TBB is, 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 is built around this concept. You create a lot of tasks. So a task is an independent unit of work. And what we did is we went through and reworked the entire OpenMP spec so everything is defined in terms of tasks. So you have implicit tasks, which is what traditional OpenMP does, and you have explicit tasks. And so you can just think about it. I define a pink task, a green task, and a purple task. I hand them to the system and I say, OK, threads, those are sitting in some kind of queue. Run them. And I don't care what order, you just run them. All right? That's what the tasks do. So here's how it would look, how I would use tasks to traverse a linked list with a while loop. All right? I've got to create my threads. We're still, we're still open MP. Pragma OMP parallel. Right? Now I want one thread to build up the work queue. So Pragma OMP single. So one thread's going to execute this code between here and here. The other threads will sit and wait at the end. All right? So now I grab the head of my list. I go through my while list, and I'm going to create a task. And I'm going to create a task for each node in that list. 
Now I need first private P. What that says is I want to capture the data environment for each task. So I create the task and put it onto the task queue and it hangs on to its address, uh, its value of P. All right, that's that first private there says. So pregnant the OMP task and capture the current view of P and hand it to that task. All right, and once again, it can be a, it can be a whole bunch of statements between curly brackets or just the single line. In this case, it's just the single statement, the function P. Now the way this executes is this is you know the same code, but now it's color coded and it could be color coded a little bit better. But as you can see, I come in here. And one thread's going to do block one, which is grab the head of the list and manage the while loop. All right. Then it's going to create task one, task two, and task three, which is one block of code in purple, another block of code in purple, another block of code in purple. And then you have the red block, which is the increment of the pointer. All right. So one thread's going to do the block one, which is the while loop, and the red, which is the increment of the pointer. And then those purple tasks are going to go on the queue. Now, those threads that are sitting at the end of the single, they're going to, as stuff drops on the queue, they'll grab the work and do it. So in this case, if I have three tasks and three threads, one thread will grab one task, another thread will grab another task, and another thread will grab the other task. And so that's the way this will work. So this lets me handle a whole range of programs that you can't do with a single parallel four, with a four construct. This gives me much, much more flexibility with OpenMP. Yes? So the, the first thread ends up the task as it is going over the list. Yep. So you can think of it a thread. In this case, I said thread one, but remember what I said was single. It's whatever thread gets there first. What about what one thread of the group? So one thread is going to walk through this while loop and populate the task queue. And then the other threads will go through and will compute the threads off that task queue. Now, there are so many details. There are a lot of low-level details. And we could spend, in fact, uh, in, in another week in Germany, I'll spend two hours just going through this in increment details. So when you start writing sophisticated code with it, you hit these details. For example, let's say this list was 10 billion elements long. It's some, I'll get to your question in a second, but, but I won't forget you. Let's say that list is 10 billion elements long. So I'm going to overflow my task queue. All right? So it's built into the standard that the system can look at it and go, wait a minute, pause this one, and let them empty out the queue a while before you start going. So there's all sorts of task switching and, and stuff going on behind the scenes to handle those cases. Now, I don't mention that because I'm going to be able to teach you all of those details now. I just wanted to leave you with the sense that, yes, we thought through a lot of the obvious things you need to do to make this style actually work. And they're all built in to, to how the tasking infrastructure works. But at the simple level, this, this is all you really need to do. One thread creates the tasks, they sit on a queue, the other threads work through the tasks. It's very, very elegant. Okay, now I'm going to come to your question. Don't worry about it. Yes, any other questions? I'm not going to get to all of the slides, but I'm going to get to the key ones here. Okay. All right. So, there's a data So, so um, let's talk about how the tasks work and where your guaranteed tasks end. So here I have a pragma OMP parallel. I've created a bunch of threads. Every single thread is going to create a task calling foo, right? In this code, the way the parallel works is all the statements in the block everyone calls. All right? So every thread creates a task. They're going to do the function foo. We say that all the tasks must be completed by the barrier. That's in the definition of the tasks. All right? So now I come in here and I have a single, and I'm going to create a whole bunch of tasks. Remember, there's a barrier implied at the end of the single. So no one goes beyond that barrier until all the tasks are complete. So tasks complete at the barriers. Now there is also a construct, and I'm going to go straight to this slide. There's also a construct called task wait. So you can insert into your program, I want you to wait until the tasks are done. 
So take a look at this code. This is an absolutely abysmal way to generate the Fibonacci sequence. But uh, it's, a, you know, it's a standard example. This is like the standard example of, if, if pi is the standard example we use for loop-oriented codes, Fibonacci sequence is the standard example we use for these task-styled APIs. So you know, here's this code. I have a function fib, and inside of it, it's going to create these two tasks. One to do fib of n minus one, the other to do fib of n minus two. And then I'm going to wait until they're done and then sum the two together. Now, because int x, y is created, you know, all the other rules on data environment, open MP apply. So inside a parallel region, if I call int x and int y, uh, int x, y, they're going to be on the thread stack. They're not shared. Therefore, when I get after these tasks, they're not going to be available. So I have to state, make x and y shared. All right? So here's another one. Okay, and I'll, I'll show you the, the fixed one for time. All right? So here's another example. I'm going to create a bunch of threads. I'm going to have a single. It's going to walk through a, a for loop, and it's going to create a whole bunch of tasks. And I use the first private to say, capture the state. So when I create the task, it captures that value of the pointer. So very straightforward. And uh, there's other examples there that show you how that works. Because I want to jump to the recapitulation. So what we've gone through here... No, don't, don't show me that now. I said, don't show me that now. Stop trying to help me out. I said, stop trying to help me out. There we go. I hate computers. Did you know that? <laughs> All right. In these last few minutes... You folks have done a great job hanging in there. But, but I want to tell you, the OpenMP memory model and the use of flush, read it. An advanced OpenMP programmer needs to understand it. What I would suggest is if you're interested in really digging into OpenMP, show up at 5. We'll get you running on your own laptop. Show up tomorrow afternoon. You'll do the exercises in OpenMP. After you've gone through all of that, come back and read this description of flush and read the atomics. To give them to you right now, your head would just explode. Boom! I don't want to go there. All right? So it really is not bad that we're skipping those now because they're really better after you've written some OpenMP code. So I just want to emphasize, I want to come back to what I started with, that parallel programming is easy. As you can see, I said most people just just use a handful of these patterns. I've already told you about the fork join pattern. You guys know it right now. It's easy. You got that down. You already know about the SPMD pattern. You're hardcore parallel programmers. You know, 99% of programs use SPMD. You're done. All right? And you know about loop parallelism. Come back and talk to me about OpenCL sometime. Or actually, we're having uh, Brian Kazantazero. I can never pronounce his name right, but... Really good speaker from NVIDIA coming tomorrow. We'll tell you all about kernel parallelism. So by the, end of the, by the end of the day tomorrow, these three major patterns that most people use, you'll know already. You guys are really far along your way to going through things. So we've talked about the SPMD pattern, where you create a collection of processes, or in the case of OpenMP threads, they look at their ID, they look at how many of them there are, they run the same code, and everything is done in parallel. Very simple, very elegant and powerful approach. We've talked about loop parallelism, where you go through and say, create a bunch of threads and split up iterations between that thread. A lot of shared address space programming. That's all there is to it. The challenge is making sure the iterations of the loops can be done independently in any order. So that's where your work is. You, know, you go through and you look, and it's like, oh, I need to change how I assign these induction variables. Or I need to modify these functions so they're thread safe. But you basically, your work is to modify the serial code so the loop iterations can execute independently in any order. And then you put a pragma OMP parallel for and you're done. So it's not that hard. All right? And, uh, and, and then we've gotten this code here. And the fork join, you've created a bunch of threads. We talked about the P threads. Now I want to close with this example. There's another real common pattern called divide and conquer. Um, this is used a lot if you think about the standard FFT algorithm, or it's used a lot in Silk. Um, the idea is you have a problem 
where you can have some method to divide it into subproblems, and this is typically a recursive scheme. So you can then split each subproblem, and then split each sub sub problem, and then split each sub 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 problem, and then yet once you get down to a certain level of granularity, you've got the subproblems so small you can compute them directly. Then you do the computation, and then you have some scheme to recombine them. So this is divide and conquer pattern. Does this seem kind of familiar to you folks? Have you seen divide and conquer before? Yes? Yes? No? Yes. So, you know, for example, look at the Pi program. Okay? A lot of code here, but not that, simple, not that hard. I create a Pi compute. I define a minimum size. And if my block, end finish to end start, is below the minimum size, I just compute the block of the loop. All right? If not, I split it. And I split it by computing where I am at the start. I create a task to do that piece. I create a task to do the second piece. I call the task wait. All right? That should look pretty straightforward with the task we called. And it's exactly an implementation of this picture here, right? I have the original one, the whole loop. I split it, so I'm doing, you know, one half loop goes here, one half loop goes there. I split it, so one half of that loop goes here, one half of that loop goes there. I split it. When I get below that minimum size, I do the computation, and then I put them together. And that's where I unwind these task weights. All right? And that's the code looks like. And when you get home tonight or this afternoon, download these slides and stare at this. I think you won't have to stare at it long until it just really makes sense. So this is the divide and conquer pattern. And it actually performs quite decently. You can look, I have pi tasks, which is using that divide and conquer pattern. And it actually performs on par with that uh, SPMD version and actually beats the loop version, which is pretty cool when you think about how much overhead there is. Now, in the long version of this course, we would explore why it actually does so well compared to the loop version, but we won't go there now. But the point is that I want to leave you with is just between 1.15 and here we are just about at 3 o'clock. 3.01, I'm late, I'm sorry. We've covered almost every single one of those key patterns. You can't believe how far you have come to the intellectual step of understanding what you need to know in parallel programming. Of course you have to go practice, but that's what you're going to do tomorrow afternoon, right? So you are really far along. Now, I'm done. Um, I will stay up here and answer questions. I have nothing else going on this afternoon until 5 o'clock. Well, actually, I have meetings, but I will answer your questions as long as you need. Thank you very much for listening to me. And I appreciate it.